welcome everybody. Um, uh, today is the second day of uh, seven South South Forum on Sustainability. And the, uh, the morning and the afternoon session is called uh, Ecological Justice Through Social Transformation. And uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five. We have uh, five speakers and also uh, three uh, discussions. And uh, the first speaker will be the um, Professor Ohashi Masaaki from University of Sacred Heart in Japan. And he also served as the, um, the director of the Janet, the largest NGO network in Japan, focusing on ODA, advocacy, and the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. And she, uh, he will uh, share his uh, PowerPoint with you. Please, Professor Masaaki Ohashi. Um, I'm quite happy that uh, I have a chance to speak uh, on this occasion, but I'm sorry that I cannot uh, come to Hong Kong. And last year I was with you. Uh, it was good uh, memory, but uh, it's no way to go out to any country. Uh, now, today I would like to speak something about this um, Japan's, uh, Japan government um, attitude about this climate change, because uh, as you all know that the, we have a Fukushima, and uh, Fukushima uh, ask, uh, um, uh, atomic um, disaster is still going on in a sense, and the Japan government want to you know, re uh, uh, start uh, our nuclear program. And while the Japan government is also still keeping the coal fire power station or even constructing new ones. So that um, is a good example of how Japanese government, our government is uh, reluctant to transform many things. And so first half is talking, we are going to talk about, about those uh, Japanese government attitude have an energy issue. And the second half is about this SDG. Um, SDG, uh, I know that many people are critical to the uh, criticizing SDG because that is just nominal things. I, I, I have to agree with those, but still it can be a kind of weapon to, to you know, see the certain direction in which way we should go. But uh, still, again, Japanese government is not uh, seriously implementing those things. So that is a part of my paper. That is my argument on my paper. So this is my introduction. You know, I, I'm not going to uh, talk to you much, but I'm uh, I'm a rather, I'm academician uh, by profession, but I'm academ ac activist of NGOs uh, or international cooperation. I spent uh, several years in Bangladesh and some years in India. Uh, so uh, that is uh, my basic, uh, you know, study place. You know, I really learned a lot from South Asia. That is why I'm here. I'm still activist in Japan, uh, rather critical to my government. So I'm teaching at the university, but. Uh, uh, at present, I'm uh, chair of the SDG, Civil Society Network Japan for SDG. So probably uh, everybody knows uh, uh, the Fukushima uh, uh, issue that uh, Fukushima is still in evacuation. I would like to say that uh, probably you see. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, at the end, uh, at the end of the uh, 2018. Uh, still, 40, more than 43,000 people are still evacuated uh, inside or outside of, of Fukushima. Um, because uh, you see those two maps. This is a map of uh, evacuation immediately after the Fukushima disaster. It is becoming much smaller. You know, those uh, orange part, green part was already uh, went away so that people can come back, though radiation level is still high. And now only this part is probably inhabitable for a decade. But still for certain part, or those green and yellow part, government going to uh, all of the people to come back, which is very dangerous for us. Uh, government is actually decontaminating, you know, this is a picture of the decontamination of the garden of maybe uh, child daycare center. And the decontamination is not really decontaminating the uh, nuclear radiation, but shifting, shifting those, you know, surface, only 20 centimeter of surface soil can, can be uh, collected in, in a big bag and collected to those places. You see the picture underneath. underneath. This is a center or a collection center of the West, nuclear waste. This is located just next to the Fukushima number one nuclear power station, which was totally damaged. So those area 
also, this place is called the temporary West, uh, West nuclear waste holding center. The, nobody believes that this is a temporary, this is a kind of permanent. Because nobody knows how to deal with nuclear waste. Um, now, government is also starting, uh, now started to say that uh, those areas, without those decontamination people can go back. Because according to them, radiation level is very low, not harm, harmful to the health of the human being, which we don't agree. And, and, and another reason why government is rather, you know, uh, hurry to, to uh, uh, lift or the ban of in entry, entering those areas is that so that they can, government and TEPCO, the Tokyo Electricity Company, can stop the uh, no, pay payment, uh, evacuation payment, and uh, uh, complete, uh, I mean, they have to pay those uh, library food assistance and the other payment. After you know, stopping, lifting those ban, they can stop paying those things. And another terrible thing, which might also affect to the Hong Kong, is that now TEPCO and my government is uh, going to try discharge all those radioactive water to the ocean. So we can share, oh no, we are now sharing the COVID-19 yeah, globally, but maybe next stage we can share the uh, Australian-born uh, nuclear radiation with all the uh, people in the world through, through the ocean. Uh, as you see, there is a huge number of uh, water tanks. Those water was uh, collected from nuclear power station. Because power station is malfunctioning, and uh, otherwise, if they don't pipe up and pipe it up on all, all those tanks, they might leak out to the ocean. So, so far, those collected wastewater was once treated to de reduce the uh, uh, amount of the nuclear uh, radiation, but they couldn't clean it up enough. So now government, and, and still even today, uh, uh, TEPCO uh, the company have to throw the water to cool down, the, cool down the reactors, and the groundwater is also flowing into the reactors. So water is increasing every day. So now there is a certain limitation, but I don't agree that they have to continuously make those tanks and keep it, you know, until unless we can invent new way to, to, to remove those nuclear uh, radiation. But government uh, uh, is saying that we have to uh, dilute it and, and discharge it. It's totally nonsense argument they are making. It's, it's very dangerous to the environment. Um, now come back to, I come to the about Japanese government uh, policy of, of the energy mix for energy mix policy they call it. 2018 they have announced. It. Uh, also we are not uh, happy with the nuclear power station. Now you see 2010 nuclear power station have maybe 20 percent, 25 percent, and then these are fossil fuels, which is uh, very much uh, um, contributing to the, uh, this. Uh, um, global uh, uh, climate change. So only this part is a non-fossil sources. After 2011, you see nuclear becomes such a small portion. So we are happy to close down, but government want to increase it to as a, again to that about 20 percent. And this is a renewable energy, renewable, renewable energy, which we must in, uh, welcome and. Uh, that, that is uh, still maybe a bit more 20 percent, almost the same to the nuclear power station, uh, energy. And this is also quite an important point that recently government of Japan has recently reduced the purchasing price. They, uh, com uh, supplementary, uh, 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 they have to, uh, for government and the TEPCO company have to buy those renew uh, renewable energy which is produced by small producers including us, with a certain price, which was much higher than buying price. But now government has tried to reduce that amount. So people have get uh, less uh, or, or maybe discouraged to make those investment on those things. And also government is going to keep a uh, coal-fired plant. They call it very high, high technique, CO2 less or something, but they're using a very strange name. So low efficient coal-fired thermal, a thermal power plant within 10 years. Ah, okay, 
okay, low efficient is the government announced uh, we have about 140 low efficient one and we reduce about 100. But now my government said instead high efficiency one will be operating or constructing in Japan, in Tokyo Bay, the one is up here, and also in Bangladesh and other places. You know, now we are still constructing the um, coal fired plant for energy. As you know, the France shut down all um, by 20, and the UK has a plan to shut down all the coal station by 25, while Germany is going to shut down by 38. But go, my government will not, um, con uh, not st stop it. Um, uh, maybe 2050, they might reduce it or they have stopped it, but not recently, quite soon. So um, this, this is a very difficult part now. We have to discuss probably, you know, new, uh, even uh, as you know, the Greta uh, has, uh, if you go to the, her Facebook, she said, Personally, I, I'm against nuclear power, power, but according to IPCC, it can be a small part of a very big new carbon-free energy solution. So how we should think about these things? That, that is my, my basic question. Um, my government will excuse that, yeah, we are going to sh sh shut down the old coal power station. Instead, we need a nuclear electricity. I don't agree with that uh, argument. We have to reduce our you know, consumption of electricity domestically, and maybe increase more in other needy countries in, in, in sustainable ways. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, know that I'm, my time is running out, so I'm in a hurry. So about SDG, you know, every, uh, everybody knows that. A lot of people are, are very much cons, you know. It is, uh, I also agree that uh, SDG based, very important fatal point is that they, 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 they didn't, um, SDG didn't mention What's the cause of the unsustainability? Whose responsibility is that? It is not mentioned. So I'm sure without you know, knowing real cause of the problem, how we can cure? So still, it has a good part is that no one should be left behind, poverty eradicated, inequality is also mentioned, migrant worker issue is also mentioned, and not, not, this is not core for the change but the transformation these are point which usually we think it's it might have some better point but i don't think uh, i'm not going to talk about much about those uh, the government japan of the structure of the sdg uh, this is they have a headquarter and in, in uh, a prime minister's office but it is not prime minister is not at all interested in um he also postponed the meet, important meeting because of corona uh, or a meeting of this sdg um, and, and the one small point is that they have a round table, which includes some NGO representatives. Um, four academicians, four NGOs, and two business, two UN organizations, uh, and some others, and Red Labor Union, and so on. So they have a small influence on, on the government. But actually, SD is implemented by MOFA, and also supported by Minister of Environment and Minister of Education. But the uh, industrial ministry is very much trying to use it to, to promote Japanese economy. Revitalizing Japanese economy is their uh, reason to utilize SDG. The government make SDG implementing guiding principle. Um, um, it is uh, every four years because the SDG is reviewed at the UN level every four years. So uh, uh, according to that, uh, government also make this uh, guiding principles. And only this year, last year, sorry, gender equality was mentioned. But uh, uh, the draft didn't mention gender equality. So those are uh, things, uh, they don't mention about the poverty issue. And, but they talk about more about, uh, you know, technology, economic uh, growth and revitalization of the uh, local communities. So, these are my point that administration is, uh, government is implementing it, but mainly MOFA office, Minister of Foreign Affairs office, not parliament is not included. And uh, uh, a political party is not so much um, interested in. And also even those, uh, and even to those, uh, uh, sorry, principles, or, or cherry picking is very uh, clear picture that 
each ministry has submitted, yes, we can do this, we can do this. We don't do that, you know. Only good part, which already each ministry has the interest or the done, those things are, are, are lined up. And basically, the, uh, again, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, again, I'm saying that uh, Japan is uh, using it to, to boost the Japanese economy, uh, technology, and local uh, vitalization. Um, so it is the shape of the Japan, not for the global uh, coexistence. So that is why I have to call the more stronger advocacy of, of civil society. I, as you know, that SD is not more than the you know, election campaign promises. I do that. If I pass, I get power, I got the chair, I will do this and that, but they never do it. So SD is also the same status. So that is why you have to make more voices. You know, so, uh, certain, SDG has a certain problems, but still, which SD, uh, civil society should uh, utilize SDG to make a much better uh, world a bit. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. And uh, the second speaker will be uh, Professor Gilberto Lopez uh, Rivas. Uh, he is uh, from uh, National Institute of Anthropology and History, uh, Mexico, and he will speak in uh, Spanish. So um, um, his uh, interpreter will be Patrick Lee. Yeah, yeah. Mi ponencia trata sobre México, sobre las resistencias indígenas y la recolonización neoliberal con el actual gobierno. Eh, autodenominado de la Cuarta Transformación. Pero antes de iniciarlo, agradezco a la estimada colega y compañera Kim Chi y a todo el equipo de la Lignan University por su amable invitación para estar en este importante foro, advirtiendo que mi participación la hago a partir de un compromiso con las resistencias eh, de los pueblos indígenas de mi país y en particular con el Congreso Nacional Indígena, Consejo Indígena de Gobierno y el Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. Resistencias desde abajo y a la izquierda para enfre enfrentar esta tormenta de alcances civilizatorios eh, que constituye la actual mundi mundialización capitalista y que se expresa en una recolonización y guerra de conquista de territorios, recursos naturales, seres humanos considerados desechables, destrucción de la naturaleza, pandemias, mismas que están llevando a la especie humana y a las formas de vida conocidas a las derivas de su posible extinción. La pandemia COVID-19, que ha impactado la vida de millones de personas en el mundo, está mostrando no solo los efectos letales de esta enfermedad viral, sino también los profundos quebrantos de los servicios de salud pública privatizados y desatendidos por los gobiernos neoliberales, así como las negligencias y los contubernios criminales de estos gobiernos que impiden adoptar políticas de salud responsables y efectivas frente a la pandemia debido sobre todo a que no desean afectar los intereses económicos de los grupos dominantes capitalistas y su propia imagen política. Es sorprendente el paralelismo de la situación creada por la actual emergencia de salud en la que estamos inmersos, con lo escrito por Carlos Taibo en su libro Colapso, Capitalismo Terminal, Transición Ecosocial, Ecofascismo en el que explora justamente las causas de un colapso sistémico de carácter global, poniendo énfasis en el cambio climático y en el agotamiento de las materias primas. Subraya que a diferencia del pasado, cuando las principales amenazas de catástrofes estaban asociadas con fenómenos naturales, a partir del siglo XX la acción humana resulta decisiva y fatal. Taibo como otros autores, prefiere hablar de cambio climático y no de calentamiento global. Y conforme a sus datos, será imposible evitar la subida de 2 a 3 grados en la temperatura media planetaria, por lo que sus consecuencias expuestas someramente corresponden con la realidad mundial que ya estamos viviendo. Elevación del nivel del mar, desaparición del hielo de los polos, 
extinción y mutación de especies, desertización, deforestación, incremento en la frecuencia e intensidad de los huracanes, dificultades crecientes para la producción de alimentos, inundaciones inéditas y para siempre incluso de tierras habitadas en litorales e islas y surgimiento de nuevas enfermedades como ha ocurrido con el COVID-19. Volver a la lectura de esta obra impactante, perturbadora e ineludible hace comprensibles y urgentes los llamados constantes de los mayas zapatistas, el Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, a organizarse ante una tormenta, dicen ellos, que no es ni metafórica ni simbólica y que alude no a una visión apocalíptica o de profecías milenaristas, sino a la posibilidad real y fundada científicamente de una catástrofe de escala mundial en un futuro cada vez más cercano que Taibo denomina colapso. Esto es el hundimiento general y masivo del sistema dominante manifiesto en reducciones sustanciales en la producción industrial, el derrumbe simultáneo y combinado de carácter financiero, comercial, político, social, cultural y ecológico debido a sus propias contradicciones y realidades verificables en sinergia con diversas y severas implicaciones previsibles y ya progresivamente manifiestas del mencionado cambio climático. En México ha sido significativo, en plena pandemia, la expedición de un decreto presidencial publicado en abril eh, por el que cercena el presupuesto de numerosas secretarías de Estado hasta con un 75% entre ellas la de cultura, con excepción de 38 programas que el presidente estima prioritarios, entre los cuales, además de programas asistencialistas individualizados y clienterales, se encuentran controvertidos megaproyectos considerados por el Congreso Nacional Indígena, Consejo Indígena de Gobierno y Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional y numerosas organizaciones comunitarias, regionales, sociales, gremiales, académicas y de investigación social, entre muchas otras, como una virtual declaración de guerra contra los pueblos indígenas y las comunidades campesinas y poblaciones urbanas que van y están siendo afectadas por los megaproyectos, sembrando vida, tren maya, desarrollo del Istmo de Tehuantepec, Proyecto Integral eh, Morelos, además del establecimiento de zonas libres en la frontera norte y la reiterada apuesta por el petróleo con los programas de rehabilitación de refinerías y construcción de una nueva, pese a las moralejas sobre el cambio climático que está dejando la pandemia en el ámbito mundial y no obstante la crisis multifactorial que aqueja el sistema capitalista en el mundo entero. El decreto no deja lugar a dudas en cuanto a las jerarquías de los recursos a distribuir por parte del gobierno y en su artículo 7 especifica con claridad tendrán trato excepcional la Secretaría de Salud, pero luego la Guardia Nacional y las Secretarías de Marina y Defensa y Defensa Nacional. Priorizar durante esta emergencia sanitaria, la Secretaría de Salud es una medida de evidente y urgente necesidad eh, para hacerle frente a COVID-19 y salvar el mayor número de vidas. Pero equiparar la salud con lo destinado a las Fuerzas Armadas resulta no solo ofensivo, sino injustificable, sobre todo en un contexto en el que pese a la emergencia de salud los problemas de seguridad pública se hacen más evidentes con un promedio constante de homicidios dolosos diarios que ronda en, las, en los 100, 100 eh, homicidios dolosos diarios y que al 20 de abril, en, en plena eh, fase 3 de la emergencia sanitaria, se registró el día más violento en muertes causadas por el crimen organizado en lo que va del año. Aparte de vigilar las fronteras sur y norte, los militares 
para evitar la migración acorde con las necesidades de nuestro buen vecino eh, Estados Unidos. Eh, los militares construyen aeropuertos, sucursales bancarias y otras funciones no establecidas en la Constitución, como la seguridad pública. Así, el decreto es la expresión de políticas propias de la acumulación militarizada, con el adelgazamiento del Estado y la imposición de megaproyectos desarrollistas que están encontrando la firme resistencia de pueblos y trabajadores que ansían un mundo distinto del que ofrece el capitalismo. Esto es, la lucha actual de los pueblos indígenas y no indígenas se sitúa en la dicotomía de posicionarse o por la vida o por la muerte. Rosa Luxemburgo, quien no vivió la pesadilla del nazifascismo ni la de la actual forma de acumulación capitalista delincuencial, necropolítica y militarizada, planteaba ya hace más de un siglo la disyuntiva entre socialismo o barbarie. Pese al colapso visiblemente en desarrollo, el capitalismo necropolítico utiliza la pandemia en favor de sus intereses de clase, con la complicidad de los estados a su servicio. A los pueblos corresponde entonces resistir unidos y organizarse por la vida y por el futuro de las generaciones venideras. El Congreso Nacional Indígena, el Consejo Indígena de Gobierno y los zapatistas han forjado, no obstante todo lo anterior, a lo largo de estas décadas, una estrategia de resistencia contra el capitalismo, que es la autonomía, la cual instituye una práctica de gobierno y de política radicalmente distinta a la que conocemos, sin burocracias, intermediarios, políticos profesionales y caudillos bonapartistas. Pese a la precariedad estructural, la guerra contra insurgente de desgaste, los paramilitares, el crimen organizado, la represión y la criminalización de sus luchas y ahora la pandemia, estos autogobiernos indígenas han mostrado su capacidad para organizar a los pueblos eh, en sus procesos de reconstitución, toma de conciencia, participación de mujeres y jóvenes, fortalecimiento de identidades étnico-culturales, nacionales y de clase, mediante la apropiación colectiva y autónoma de la seguridad comunitaria, la impartición de justicia, la salud, la educación, la cultura, la comunicación y las actividades económicas y productivas, así como la defensa del territorio y sus recursos naturales. Cabe señalar que México parece ser el paradigma de todas las violencias y daños sociales causados por las políticas de acumulación militarizada y por desposesión puestas en práctica por la globalización neoliberal. El proceso de recolonización integral de países, señalado por el grupo al que pertenezco, Paz con Democracia, llevó a México a una situación límite de tal naturaleza que acorde al Instituto de Estudios Estratégicos de Londres, nuestro país, México, es considerado el segundo más letal después de Siria en lo que en lo que calificó este instituto como un conflicto armado no reconocido. Esta violencia cotidiana que atraviesa todos los ámbitos rurales y urbanos y que ha afectado la vida de numerosas familias mexicanas fue una ca causa importante de la implosión electoral del, 2000, del 2018. Eh, mi opinión es que se requiere analizar las bases que sustentan la llamada cuarta transformación con la que se autocalifica el gobierno actual, distinguiendo lo fenoménico y epidérmico de lo estructural. La lucha contra la corrupción, sin una ruptura con el modelo desarrollista capitalista fincado en, fincado en los megaproyectos, no sienta las bases para pensar que estamos a las puertas de un cambio de las dimensiones históricas de la independencia nacional 
en el siglo XIX, la reforma y la revolución social de 1910. Negar la aplicación en México de la lucha de clases, como lo hace el presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador, quererse situar como árbitro supremo de los conflictos sociales y pretender fundar la transición solo en el adelgazamiento del Estado y su transformación en un aparato redistributivo eficaz no es suficiente para lograr los fines trascendentes de un cambio histórico de la República. Precisamente el neoliberalismo se caracteriza por buscar que el Estado actúe como un expedito mecanismo de intermediación que facilite el proceso de recolonización de los territorios. Y en esta dirección, la lucha contra la corrupción y el adelgazamiento de las estructuras gubernamentales, si bien podría ser positiva en el terreno de un imaginario nacional de indignación ante la impunidad de la clase gobernante del pasado en el saqueo del erario público, constituyen sin duda un factor en favor de México dentro de los estados nacionales en competencia para una aplicación sin contratiempos de los proyectos neoliberales como los emprendidos por la 4T. Ya no me da tiempo, ya casi estoy al final de mis 15 minutos, pero eh, pues eh, se comprueba la metáfora del subcomandante Moisés que dice cambian los mayordomos y capataces, pero el dueño de la finca, el capitalismo, sigue siendo el mismo. Cambian los gobiernos, pero el dueño de la finca sigue siendo el capitalismo. Muchas gracias. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gilberto and Patrick. Patrick, excuse me, from uh, Venezuela. So it's uh, also kind of uh, Latin America in solidarity. And the, sec the third uh, speaker will be uh, Jorge Ishishawa from Pratec, Peru. Actually, it's a school for uh, indigenous and peasant uh, technology. So, uh, Jorge, please. I, I'm going to, to make a few points uh, uh, regarding science for these times. And um, the the problem that we have uh, in in these uh, times is that actually the all these uh, efforts in the for the sustainable development uh, goals is that it it has very little official science or uh, say scientific uh, uh, knowledge in the sense or the spirit of the uh, sustainable development goals science in its uh, beginnings in its origin and it has not changed much is mainly for war and war in the sense of war on nature, and that means um, the application in, in technical uh, uh, apparatuses that only bring a destruction. There is, of course, other scientific efforts but the main, the official, the prevailing type of scientific research that is being done nowadays, it's warlike. I don't know if you agree with me, but the, the point is, how do we go about uh, developing something that we have for science as a uh, for building a, a, a better world. Uh, and, uh, and we have been trying to, to find some uh, inspiration in the uh, communities where we have been working with uh, all these uh, 20, 30 years we have uh, doing this uh, the, 
studies and in research in with uh, indigenous communities in the Peruvian Andes and the Amazon, uh, the Amazon also. And when we see this, uh, the what we find in difference is the idea of science for living in the in these indigenous communities the idea that i am trying to transmit here is what type of uh, sciences have been developed uh, and i'll uh, make use of the idea of the relationship between the three levels or, or I'll say components or uh, areas that we find uh, involved in uh, scientific de development. This, uh, uh, that is to say, we are used to saying that uh, uh, the sustainable development goals are based on a global science or science that takes care of uh, global issues and there are the other two that are considered use, usually in the social sciences also which is the social level and the local level what we have here is the the application uh, in the issue of making science for people uh, the idea of The, of applying cyber, cybernetic notions. I think this idea of uh, cybernetics uh, thinking is very important for uh, the development of uh, this, uh, for um, making true the promises of the sustainable development goals. The, but the thing is that since uh, the idea of cybernetics is not developed uh, fully in the three levels and connecting the three levels is the, the problem that we find in the, in the inutility of this uh, inability of this science uh, that we call modern or that is being uh, actually uh, merged into what we now un understand or uh, you know, uh, call techno science it's located only in in the in the idea of uh, the exploitation of nature so we let's retake the three levels as components not talking about community or local social and global but change it into personal community and global these three areas that we i would like to connect in order to take into account this uh, basic uh, instrument or tool of uh, cybernetics which is the operation of recursion recursion the recursive a relationship is the idea that is in 
uh, included in the um, in the understanding of the the local communities, uh, the, the indigenous communities, uh, that we can uh, identify. The science, as a modern science, is, as I said, a war on nature. In uh, indigenous epistemes, what we have is that nature forms part of the world to which we also belong. And this idea of including nature is something, is including nature as part of belonging and in relationship and in community is something that the indigenous communities uh, of all over the world uh, have as central. So the, the idea is that the good intentions of the sustainable development goals cannot be realized unless we have these three areas considered as only views of the same world or the same reality and intimately interconnected. A science, modern science or modern techno science cannot do that because for it the relationship is one of uh, exclusion actually, in practical terms. There is no concept of including nature as part and, uh, say, a talking part of the conversation. So, uh, this, the, the spirit uh, that we have been trying to uh, uh, develop in the idea or the approach we have been trying to develop in the uh, in our projects is to uh, take up this basic epistemological stance in our work to try to uh, avoid the hierarchical position that we assume uh, in the in the in relationship between uh, individuals community uh, society and the whole world and the global institutions uh, I don't know if I have still time, and I have been very, very uh, unclear, and my English is, is not uh, is not good. But uh, I don't know if uh, the uh, this idea. Uh, I would like to close it with the addition of the political uh, component in this uh, worldview uh, based on the experience with uh, indigenous communities, which is, is the notion of not hierarchy, that is considering individual, community, uh, society, and uh, whole world, as a hierarchical uh, classification, but uh, the notion of heterarchy, the notion that there is no a 
boss. But we are all involved, each in the in the, its own role, in his own role or her own role, in the in life, in the management of, of that universe, in conjunction, in community with all, in which uh, a world in which no one is less. Uh, this idea of heterarchy, I, I would like to, to, to express it in this way. Uh, it is not A and B in relationship, uh, in a hierarchical relationship without including someone else. But so you have to negotiate who is the boss. No, there is no boss here because if A obeys to B and B obeys to C, C obeys to A, we have here a recursion in the political sense so that there is no hierarchy. Uh, this idea of heterarchy is something that actually I'm trying to understand much more and trying to make it applicable to our relationships with, with in our work. All relationships are heterarchical. Let's say, is to, uh, it, when we have a relationship, it's not binary, it's not one A and B. There is always a C representing the whole, the, the whole rest of the world. Who, that is also uh, participating in this relationship and in, the, in, in life. A, and B, for instance, in the community, it says the relationship is one of reciprocity. It is not. Community is defined not by reciprocity, it's defined by gratuity. Because there is always a third, a third included in this world that a, provides the uh, equilibrium the, that makes this relationship, as uh, Ivan Yelich used to call, convivial. Well, uh, that's, my time is up, I think, uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Jorge. And um, I think you, are, you raised a very important question, the very fundamental question, what is science and how it relates to the, um, uh, the nature and also uh, human relations, and also stress the, um, the relations uh, within the uh, communities. How can we uh, challenge the uh, hierarchical or patriarchal relations? And um, so um, the, the next speaker will be uh, Vijay Parash. And uh, he is the um, director of the uh, uh, Tricontinental uh, Institute for Social Research. And he is also an Indian historian, journalist, commentator, and a Marxist intellectual. Uh, Vijay, please. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to present uh, something which slightly changes the title of this session. Uh, I'm going to just add the letters IST. So rather than ecological justice through social transformation, I'm going to present on ecological justice through socialist transformation. And let's see if we can do something interesting with that. Um, okay. There are just three parts to this presentation and I shouldn't take very long. Uh, there's not much to say about the socialist transition because never before has socialism seemed so necessary as in the middle of this pandemic where we see 
particularly in the advanced capitalist states, governments flounder before the virus, seem incapable of dealing with it, utterly incompetent as they've hollowed out their own states. Uh, it's the curse of the neoliberal project that they have no public health systems to manage the contagiousness of this virus. And they seem in their lack of seriousness to have demonstrated really the collapse of the bourgeois project. If all they can provide is Bolsonaro, if all they can provide is Trump, Narendra Modi and so on, their project is utterly exhausted. So I think this bears some reflection. Um, as I said, there'll be three points. The first is rather simple. The pandemic has demonstrated, I think, a couple of things. One, that indeed the old Marxist belief that it's labor that creates value is certainly true, because as this virus-enforced general strike has taken place with billions of people out of work, the world economy has ceased. You can't say that value is created out of the brain of Jeff Bezos or out of the brain of Bill Gates and so on. Value is created through the exploitation of labor power, commodity, and surplus value extracted from that. It's very clear that that you know, discovery made by Karl Marx has been proved by this virus-induced general strike around the planet. But it showed something other than that as well, that as you take out the massive use of carbon for energy, the environment begins to clear up a little bit. Um, it proves something, but it doesn't solve anything. Because what it proves, of course, is that carbon fuels are extremely corrosive to the fragile ecosystem of the planet. But the answer to that, of course, is not to withdraw from industrial society and return to a pre-industrial age. I don't think that's necessarily possible. And I don't think that's something that, um, at least to my mind, is to be promoted. Uh, because I think there's an element of cruelty in the romance of the pre-industrial world, particularly given that billions of people remain without necessary and adequate food, without the possibility of educational systems and so on. You know, it's quite easy for people on computers to write essays saying that um, we need to have a world without so much technology and energy use. Well, it's okay for you. You have an air-conditioned room and a computer but there are people who cannot eat. What about them? There is a divide in the way in which energy is used. So the pandemic has shown us, I think, that um, yes, indeed, if we shut down carbon fuel, it does improve the environment. I think one should concede that. The second point I want to raise and ask the question of is, is a Green New Deal possible under the capitalist system? Can capitalism, for instance, um, you know, uh, can it make a transition, as it were, to a post-carbon energy landscape? Well, the answer is yes, it is possible. Um, it will be extraordinarily expensive to make the transition to green energy, you know, for instance, renewable fuels and so on. It will be extraordinarily expensive. But it's possible. It's not impossible. In other words, capitalism merely has a conjunctural relationship to carbon fuels, not a necessary relationship. Capitalist production doesn't require carbon-based energy. It merely has a historical and conjunctural relationship with carbon-based energy. It could very well, you know, you could very well continue capitalist relations of production with another source of energy. It's possible. The problem is. The transition from carbon to another energy fuel is very expensive. And the quest question will always be, who has to foot the bill for that transition? That's the real question. It's not that you know capitalism somehow is integrally related to carbon. I think that's a very trivial uh, position. There's no integral relation. It's a historical conjunctural relation. In other words, the dawn of capitalism, the principle energy utilized was carbon-based fuel. That's a conjunctural relationship. It's not that capitalism developed because of carbon fuel. Capitalist relations can survive into a post-carbon scenario, but it will require a lot of 
effort and resources to make the transition. So who is going to foot the bill for that transition? As of now, it's a very ugly situation. It looks like private corporations are not going to foot this bill, as they often don't. They often rely on social funds, taxpayer funds, state intervention to finance major infrastructural development. Private capital is extraordinarily risk averse when it comes to funding major transitions. It was not private capital that produced the internet. That was public financing. It's often not even private capital that produces new vaccines and drugs. Look at the case of the COVID-19 vaccine. There's immense public funds going into private companies to produce this vaccine. Why public funds are not going into public companies to produce the vaccine is a consequence of neoliberalism, not of rationality. There's no necessity for public funds to go to private companies to produce a vaccine. Private pharmaceutical companies, in my opinion, should not exist. They are merely there for profit gouging, but that's a separate question. Private companies are not going to bear the cost for the transition to a post-carbon future. This is going to be offlaid to the state. That's one major cost. The second thing that people in the whole Green New Deal arena don't deal with is the cost that will be paid by the third world in this transition. And I'm going to give you two examples. You see, to make a transition to, let's say, renewables, including, for instance, solar, the principal issue isn't harnessing solar energy. I mean, there's the sun. It's up there. You can harness it. The problem is storing the energy. That's a major problem. Energy is stored in batteries. The main batteries we have require cobalt and lithium. These are the main batteries we have now. It's possible, of course, that new kinds of batteries will be created in the future. Our institute has looked very seriously, both at lithium and cobalt. Let's take them sequentially. If you look at cobalt, which is essential for the batteries we have, because as I said, the question of renewables isn't that we don't know how to harness solar energy. It's that we don't know how to store it. You harness it in photovoltaic cells. That's fine. But then you have to store it. You're not going to use it immediately. After all, at night, you still need energy. And if the sun is gone, you need to have stored the energy during the day to use it at night. It's just ipso facto. So the problem with renewables is often storage of energy, not harnessing of energy. To store, you need a battery. The kind of batteries we have today rely on cobalt and they rely on lithium. Let's take cobalt first. Cobalt is largely mined in the Congo. The company that is involved in this is a company, a Swiss company called Glencore. Rather hideous company by all accounts. You can go and see the record on Glencore. It's mostly publicly available, although I must say Switzerland, for all its reputation of being a fair country and neutral and so on, is extraordinarily jealous of its corporate records and does not allow you to have a look at legal cases against corporations and so on. In other words, it's extraordinarily pro-corporate and anti-people. You know, you, you know this from the history of Swiss banks. And of course, we know this from the history of Swiss banks and Nazi gold, uh, famously utilized to you know, swindle European people and funnel that money to South America to finance you know, the death squads of Bolivia that pretended to be security agencies recruited and trained by the Nazis. That gold came from the Swiss banks. But anyway, that's a digression. Um, Glencore is mining cobalt in the Congo. Labor is hired through two means. One is directly by the firm, secondly, through so-called artisanal mining. Artisanal mining is another way, a fancy way, because artisanal is just a fancy word. It's like organic. Artisanal mining is another way of talking about the informal sector. If you're clever, you'll notice that artisanal mining is a cover for child labor. So here we are, we're promoting the Green New Deal. That's great. But you're not asking the serious questions, which is, if you're going to move to renew renewables, you need to store the energy. If you've got to store the energy, you need a battery. If you need to, a battery, you need cobalt. The cobalt is being mined by children in the Congo, profits made by a, a Swiss company. By the way, Glencore was founded by Mark Rich. Some people may remember Mr. Rich, well-named, 
was the last person pardoned by Bill Clinton before he left office to give way to that other great democratic statesman of the world, George W. Bush. He pardoned Mark Rich for crimes in the United States, but Rich was perfectly safe in Switzerland where his company Glencore is basically making Congo, Southern Congo particularly, a giant hole dug by children to bring out cobalt so that you can have batteries so that Western governments can have a Green New Deal and not deal with the fact that the costs of that transition are being borne by Congolese children. That's Congo on the one side. Remember I said this transition is going to be expensive. One cost is going to be paid by taxpayers because private corporations don't want to take a risk. They don't want to invest in this transition. The second cost is being paid by Congolese people. That country destroyed by 100 years of colonialism continuing today and onward. The second principal earth mineral needed is lithium. There are, of course, three countries in South America in the lithium triangle. There's Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Bolivia has the best lithium because it's up high and it's abundant. You know, it's true that in the flats of Chile, it's easier to get the lithium out because it's less moist and so on. Our team has looked into this, and I have to tell you that the November 2019 coup against Evo Morales was about lithium and it was about indium, which makes flat screen TVs and this computer that's right in front of me, which has a flat screen TV, which requires indium, which is largely mined in Bolivia. And people who turn around now and say, well, Evo Morales, that was about democracy. They are not people who understand how the realities of the world work because the mining companies have wanted Mr. Morales and the movement for socialism out of office 13 years ago when they first took office. The United States government has tried to overthrow that government since the day Evo Morales and Alvaro Garcia Lilera won the election. They've tried to get them out since then. And as soon as they got out, this so-called head of government, Jeanette Anes now, tested a belief for COVID-19, has welcomed multinational corporations with a red carpet, including Elon Musk, who has been talking to that other great thug in South America, Yair Bolsonaro, also tested positive for COVID-19. And Musk has told the Bolsonaro government they want to create an electric car factory in, in, in Brazil and mine the lithium from Bolivia, which they will directly bring into Brazil to their, their factory. Now, you tell me that these political changes in Brazil and Bolivia have nothing to do with the fantasies of the Green New Deal and the role Elon Musk plays in this. In this you tell me this has nothing to do with that. And I would like you to give me an alternative explanation. The cost for the Green New Deal is going to be borne by the people of the Congo and the people of Bolivia indigenous people who are being hunted down by this government so that in the election which they keep putting off, the MAS government will not come back to power. They're going to make sure of that because there's too much at stake. What's at stake, by the way, is the Green New Deal. So it's not that this is a Trump agenda. This is the agenda of the American ruling class and Western governments that want to make this transition to a post-carbon world, but on the backs of who? On the same people, the Bolivian indigenous who saw their silver sucked out by Spain for hundreds of years. You know, when Galeano wrote Open Veins of Latin America, the focus of it was Bolivia. A vacuum cleaner sucked out the precious wealth of South America, took it to Spain, which took it to Britain, where you had this great industrial revolution and so on. So the second point I want to make is a serious point, which is that this Green New Deal is possible under capitalism. It's not that it's impossible, but the costs are going to be borne by ordinary taxpayers because private companies are not going to risk investment, and it will be borne by the people of the Congo, the people of Bolivia, etc., where the essential materials to make batteries are going to come from. That's the, the, the second point. The third point I want to make has three little parts. If we're serious about the transition, we need to think about waste, the massive waste that a capitalist civilization has put on the earth. And I'm going to talk about three kinds of waste. The first kind of waste is waste itself. I mean, I don't know if you've looked into this, but it is extraordinary 
how much waste is generated in the planet you know the um, united nations calculates these numbers these are all not even realistic numbers because they're based on estimates i think if you have the real figures it will be much more shocking than that you know billions of tons of plastic just dumped into the world every year the number i want to give you isn't the total sum of waste because that's an estimate i want to give you the percentages um it's stunning to me that only 5.5% of global waste is composted 13% of global waste is recycled that's 18 and a half percent of global waste that is not dumped into oceans or burnt or put into landfills in other words 81 and a half percent of the waste generated in the world is thrown into oceans it's burnt or it's dumped in landfills i mean capitalist civilization with this tendency of overproduction and you know this obsolescent consumption generates enormous quantums of waste which might satisfy momentary urge and make you feel like a human being i just bought something interesting so i'm going to throw something away it turns out that the united states of america that great beacon of enlightenment with 5% of the world's population generates 40% of the world's waste Th that to me is an astounding figure that's not a number i came up with that's a united nations number the united states of america 5% of the world's population generates 40% of the world's waste i mean when is the question of waste going to be brought up in the ipcc discussions you know the ipcc is always about let's cut down on carbon emissions what about on waste because that impacts on this if so much of human waste is plastic plastic is a direct product of petroleum if you're only recycling 13% if you're throwing almost 82% of your garbage into the oceans burning it putting it into landfills you're generating an enormous amount of you know not only carbon but you <laughs> you you're just producing things that have to be dealt with by the earth and you know i'm going to leave that there second thing is war um there was a figure recently that came out a report came out that the united states mili military is the world's largest institutional emitter of carbon i mean we're talking now about the us military as a large corporation which is indeed it is with bases in you know all across the world i mean this is an incredible phenomena the war as a generator of carbon uh, if you add up all the world's militaries and see how much carbon they generate it's it is a mind blowing number and our team is trying to put together what is the total quantum of all military activity and its share of um, the carbon budget let's not look at the carbon budget in terms of nations let's look at it in terms of sectors which are the sectors that we just don't need we don't need militaries let's add up all the let's look at how much the militaries generate carbon and how much other sectors generate carbon and i think the answer is pretty clear already from this number that came out um from brown university project which showed that the united states military is world largest institutional emitter of carbon so the second thing i'm suggesting and this is a research exercise is at an ipcc instead of looking at national you know contribution to the carbon budget let's look at it sectorally let's look at which sectors in the world you know which social sectors emit the most amount of carbon and i think one will find that the military plays a big role in this and then you have to wonder do we really require military i mean japan we were talking about fukushima a second ago is it really necessary for japan now to abrogate article 9 and i'm not talking even about de jure abrogation it's de facto abrogation because japanese government now saying let's move to first strike capability is that genuinely necessary i mean isn't disarmament the way to go it doesn't seem like it we, we seem to be i agree with horhe entirely science is so much given over to war making um this is something young people particularly need to consider seriously the third thing um this pandemic has shown us that the global supply chain is actually quite a broken instrument it's 
economically efficient. I'm not sure this is a long term sustainable way to go. The United States government is interested in using this crisis to smash China out of the global supply chain. That's a political endeavor. I don't think that is a serious thing. Much more serious is we need to rethink the global supply chain and think again about regional supply chains, bolstering regional economies. You know, this was what the Bolivarian project was to be about in Latin America, particularly South America. You know, the creation of a virtual currency so that you don't have to use the US dollar in intergovernment, in interstate trade in South America. And the currency they came up with was the Sucre. You know, why can't regions integrate and trade in the region rather than having to have things sourced from so far away that the carbon footprint of the global supply chain just makes the goods, you know, reek with carbon. Is that genuinely necessary? Do you really need all iPhones made in Shenzhen? You know, do all, you know, footballs need to be stitched in Pakistan by children? Is that genuinely necessary? Can't we build regional supply chains with much lower carbon footprint? Aren't there ways to start thinking about a socialist transition that don't involve this reliance on immense externalities of costs, externalities to the taxpayer because private corporations just won't do it, externalities to people in countries like the Congo, Bolivia, and so on. Isn't there another way to imagine the world? Why must we imagine the world with the same amount of energy use and think of the substitution merely being source of energy? Can't we think of using less energy I'm, I'm thinking about not so much waste of energy. Can't we harness human resources in a much more rational way? So I want to end with this, this question. Is I would really recommend that we not get swept into seductive slogans like the Green New Deal, which bury underneath them a host of questions about the social relations of production, and about the international relations of imperialism. Buried under this phrase, a very beautiful, delightful phrase, Green New Deal, can be lots of stuff that unless you look closely at it and unpack it, you will be like that mouse led by Pied Piper into the water before you know it. Thanks a lot. Uh, quick response to your efforts to, um, to, to change or to... Um to uh, change the title of uh, ecological justice through the socialist transformation because uh, in our uh, two groups uh, uh, we have a discussion about how to um, make it uh, good, make it better, the um, title. That means that include more people to, to think about the e ecology and also climate change. And the, uh, at the very beginning, the title is the climate change and also social transformation. And after that, uh, they think that the uh, ecological justice is better. And now you uh, make an effort to change it, social transformation into socialist transformation. And actually, we also have a discussion about socialism and communism. If uh, we change change uh, from socialist to communist. This is uh, another um, uh, big debate about the how can we uh, to uh, think about the uh, 20th century legacy of uh, communist revolution. So uh, tomorrow we have a discussion about socialism and also <laughs> communism. And uh, we, uh, you are all welcome, welcome to that uh, section. And um, so um, you also raised the questions of the unequal development uh, between the global north and the global south. And uh, this is also what I mean uh, criticize uh, the, uh, how can we have the voices from the global south and have a big alliance between the Latin America, Africa and uh, Asia. And so um, we now move to the um, progressive uh, intellectual from the global north. And so uh, <laughs> the fifth speaker will be uh, John Foran from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, United States. Please, John. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, perhaps following in the footsteps of Vijay, I would suggest that we talk about an eco-socialist transformation, or indeed an intersectional eco-socialist transformation. I want to start by thanking Kin Chi for her support and encouragement of the Global University for Sustainability over many years. 
<clears throat> and needless to say, I'm delighted to be part of this session and the conference of which it is part. Indeed, this is not a conference in the usual awful sense, but explicitly a forum, and we are invited to speak from the heart, to engage fully, to listen well, and to build bridges. And all of this delights me. In fact, I'd like to read the statement from the organizers which attracted me to this forum. It follows as this. The South-South Forum on Sustainability hopes to bring together old and new generations of committed people working for ecological and socioeconomic justice to articulate knowledge produced by experiences on the field, common reflections, and new findings about the critical reality in particular from communities that defend their commons. It hopes to help cross-fertilize initiatives practiced by organizations and networks to foster further interconnections. It hopes to experiment with creative and self-reliant forms of interacting, networking, and managing resources. So I really thank the organizers for that statement. And from that starting point, I'd like to add a few thoughts for our conversations by speaking to three of the discussion questions that have been suggested for speakers on these two sessions on ecological justice and social transformation. The first question, how do you see the most acute crises and burning issues of today as related to climate change and human induced disasters in your region, country, or community? A sober look at the root causes of the present crisis points unambiguously to the normal workings of capitalism as an economic system and a way of life, as perhaps the prime reason for the interconnected ills that beset us. Underlying this, we find the patriarchal and racial hierarchies that capitalism's elites thrive on, the history of their colonial plunder and the dysfunctional operation of neoliberal globalization, and the militarism, violence, and lack of participation that permeate and poison our cultures. On top of it all, the climate crisis made by the endless search for profit over people, the planet, and life itself, now condemns us to a future of extreme weather in ecosystems that will not recover for an eternity of generations to come. To be clear, it's the interconnected nature of the economic, political, and cultural crises of our times with the climate crisis that is at the root of our predicament in this century. And now we have the wake-up moment of the coronavirus breaking upon these structural systemic burdens. Suddenly, it seems like we might have a quintuple crisis on our hands, namely, one, the inequality that neoliberal capitalist globalization produces. Two, the democracy deficit or the lack of faith everywhere in existing political parties. Three, the culture of violence and militarism. Four, the climate emergency. And five, the corona crisis. The Floyd rebellion against racism and the evils that come from it in the United States, my country, is significant enough already to speak of a sextuple crisis, a six-fold crisis. A second question from the organizers to us. How might we analyze climate justice issues as connected to financial capitalism, globalization, colonization, modernization, and so forth? Well, how do we connect this many dots that's an open question for me. I believe that working on intersecting crises on so-called wicked problems is the order of the day. And as in most things, the very interlocking of our crises gives me hope for confronting them with courage and vision. Meanwhile, our time in history at the beginning in 2020 of what we might call the decade of decision drives home the point that these levels of inequality in my own society and around the world are not only intolerable for vast numbers of people, real, actually existing people like you and me, but also should be unacceptable 
to all human beings with a conscience and eyes to see. But all of this appears to be largely invisible to the holders of economic and political power in my country. And this may be because they, in fact, bear responsibility for it. There's no reason to expect this elite of the 1%, either in the United States, in Russia, in China, in Brazil, in India, in the United Kingdom, all of which are ruled by racist patriarchal demagogues, to do anything about it. They have no plan worthy of the name. And here I disagree a bit with Vijay that the Green New Deal uh, is the vision of Elon Musk and Trump and so forth. That's another conversation to have. Even if they did want to do something, their hands, these leaders, are tied by the systems of neoliberal capitalist globalization, which has no solution to economic inequality and decent democratic political decision making. That much is clear. Third and final question, how could we redefine and substantiate the concept of social transformation or alternatives? What are some propositions for alternative theories, praxis, policies? My life comes down to doing what I can to be with others and to confront the climate crisis. I know of two ways to do so, through the global network of climate justice movements, and through the actual construction of systemic alternatives. We need to do both, that's clear. And what I'd like to do now is to share a story about efforts that I'm involved with to set out on the path of such a systemic alternative right here in Santa Barbara, California, an unlikely place for such an experiment. In the little town of Isla Vista, adjacent to the university where I teach, Community interest in carbon neutrality, just transition, critical ecological post-sustainability, and systems change from below has grown deep roots, I would say, in the last two, three, four years. We're aiming, uh, we formed a group colorfully and in, uh, I don't know, flourishingly calling ourselves EcoVista instead of Isla Vista which aims to encourage and inspire the foundation of an eco-village with renewable energy, a flourishing and regenerative agroecology of public urban gardens, cooperative affordable eco-housing, a circular eco-economy based on solidarity and capable of meeting the real needs of the inhabitants and radical self-governance, community priorities determined by all who reside here all within a vibrant web of imagination and cultural creativity. And I should mention in this community of 23,000 people, 80% are between the ages of 18 and 24. In other words, they're students, university students. Conceptual, so there's a lot of cultural creativity. Conceptually, our efforts draw on the latest thinking about transition towns, degrowth, Wayne Vivier, just transition, radical climate justice, intersectional eco-socialism, and the many worlds to be found in the path-breaking book Pluriverse, a post-development dictionary edited by Alberto Acosta, Federico de Maria, Arturo Escobar, Ashish Kotari, and Ariel Saleh. Another approach that guides our thinking and practice is Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy which counsels working from the bottom up in an inclusive and unpredetermined way to generate a collective analysis that enables members to articulate their desires and dreams for what could be. We know that to achieve this aspirational aim will require significant political organization, social movement building, and visionary policy proposals, including the design of strategies for achieving a systemic alternative in our context, and perhaps even the invention of a new kind of party. What does this mean? A new kind of party, not another new party. On a world scale, my best idea is that we try to leverage the strength and power and beauty of our many movements and ideas into a new kind of entity, a completely new kind of party that can take political power away from those who hold it in place after place. 
In time, these experiments with the unknown would be able to support each other and link themselves together to find and co-create the pathways to the future we want. These new entities that come out of our movements must be made to live up to their promise and to enact our dreams by us, their only possible guarantors. And in this, it's a different model than even those put forward by Podemos, Syriza, and other green left parties. Such new parties, if they emerge, and the broader diverse social movements that must drive them and hold them accountable, will need to link arms firmly with existing transition initiatives, all the systemic alternatives all over the world, the many projects of creation that are being built and will need to be built everywhere. And they must synergistically support each other's efforts to fashion the collective power we need for global governance. Then we might see a people's cop at the UN climate negotiations, which are currently a joke, to articulate what activists call a fab, fair, ambitious, and binding universal climate treaty. Then we would be able to tax and legislate the fossil fuel corporations out of business. Then we would be able to take on the legacy of inequality and genocide that the United States has been built on. Then, as the Zapatistas, those unprofessionals of hope often say, we want a world where many worlds fit. That world, somehow containing our many worlds, will be created and constructed by all of those who are willing to seek it, to do the hard work, which, let's not forget, also brings so much joy and purpose, and to embrace hope, imagination, and heart in equally abundant measure. I offer these comments in the hope of generating further participation and passionate commitment among listeners and the millions of ordinary people who must rise to our common occasion. Because there are many lessons to learn, one for every day of the rest of our lives. And that for, for that reason, we should look at today and tomorrow and the day after as opportunities to learn, to grow, to find each other and to make change systemic change, system change, not climate change. The path will be long, hard, dangerous, and difficult, friends. So this is a time for joyful, radical action, for a joyful militancy. Let's get going. Thank you. <laughs>